I'm Got Bell Nick. I'm here with attorney Victor Baki, and we'll just jump right into it. So, with the police chief, why are we paying him an extra $250,000 to retire? The reason is because he signed a contract with the city and county um, a few years ago, giving him a five-year employment contract, guaranteed employment. And right now, they're trying to fire him because they don't like him anymore. And so, under the terms of his contract, they have to buy him out if they're going to fire him without cause. And that's the whole issue in this case is whether or not the grand jury investigation and the target letter that he received would constitute just cause as a reason to fire him. If it is, then he's not entitled to any money in addition to what he would get as his normal pension. But this buyout kicks in if they terminate his contract early without cause. And that's the deal they signed with him, and now they got to live by it. The problem is, not with where we're at now, but it's with these contracts, because we see it again and again with state employees in high-level positions getting these contracts that say, well, if we have to let you go, we're going to pay you out. And in every one of those cases, the argument has been whether or not there was sufficient cause to terminate them. And in every one of those situations, the government has settled with them saying, well, we'd rather just pay you out than go to court and risk being found that we fired them in violation of the contract and then getting hit with punitive damages and things that can run up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay, so for people who don't know why, how is it that after two years of this federal probe, and a target letter being sent to five police officers as well as the police chief, how does that not constitute cause for dismissal? Because there's been no finding by a third body showing that he's committed a crime. Mm. He's under investigation and he's innocent until proven guilty and there's nothing immediate um, in front of the commission that would say that he is you know, somehow a danger to the community or the police department can't function under him. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things, it doesn't pass the smell test. Everybody knows that something's going on, but until it does, mm -hmm. there's really no basis to fire him. But that's gonna be the subject of the litigation and the lawsuit. So the city's saying, we don't wanna go and argue that. We'll just pay him out now and let him go mm -hmm. rather than keep him for a couple months and then fire him and then take the chance that it was with or without cause. Mm. With some of the details that you just explained, wouldn't it make far better sense for the taxpayers to actually hedge and wait for this to play out to see if he's actually indicted or to see if he actually is uh, guilty if he is indicted versus just paying him out now with the lump sum and then telling him to go away, in a sense, rewarding him for the bad behavior or the pending bad behavior. That, that's a great point. And that's what only one of the commissioners seemed to pick up on, which is why are we in such a rush now? Let's just sit and wait and let the investigation play out because if he gets indicted um, and even worse, convicted, then there's no question of the cause and the state is covered. And they save $250,000. Um, that could very easily be done. The commission, however, has seemed to take in the position that they'd rather not risk it. They'd rather pay the 250000 now, close the case, and start looking for a new police chief mm -hmm. and put an end to all of this and not risk being hit with a civil lawsuit later. So they're looking at more than just the numbers, the police commission. They're looking at the public trust in the police department. But again, they weren't saying that for the last 16 months. They kept saying, well, he hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't done anything wrong. Well. As we stand here today, he still hasn't done anything wrong. So mm -hmm. that's where the community is like, what, 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 why do we have this rush? Why are we cutting him loose, paying him this money? When we all know he probably did something wrong and will probably get indicted and maybe he'll get convicted, maybe he won't, but that's the way the system works. It was smart to put in the clause where if he's convicted of a felony, he is to return the $250,000 uh, settlement. However, 
is there's some sort of smoke screen that works out to his advantage. For example, can he plead out to something, maybe admit guilt, but then take a deferral of some sort, or maybe even be involved in some sort of pleading out on a misdemeanor and then still keep the money just because it's not a felony? Uh, absolutely. The, the contract that they're signing now says if he gets convicted of a felony, he's got to give the money back. But what if it doesn't, it doesn't provide for what happens if there's some other conviction or some mm -hmm. type of judicial dismissal or something like that. This whole situation would be cured very easily, which is to just say, look, we agree you're entitled to the 250000 but we're going to hold on to it until this case is resolved. Once you're cleared, we'll give you the 250000 If you're not cleared, we're keeping it. Because in reality, if this plays out over the next year, two or three, is the city really going to get 250000 back from Chief K. Aloha? No. He's going to spend it and the money will be gone. It makes no sense to think that he would sit and hold $250,000 just in case he has to give it back. So why give it to him in the first place? He's waiting to see if he's going to have to give the money back. The city's waiting to see if they're going to get the money back. So it makes no sense. Just wait until there's a decision and then give the money once. This, this going back and forth sounds like high school. You know, mm -hmm. um, It makes no sense at all. And the big thing is, it's the city's money. The commission, they don't care. They're just throwing numbers around, pay here, pay there. It's, it's really ridiculous. It's, if, that was, if that was any member of the public's own money pulling it out of their pocket, there's no way they would hand this guy $25, much less $250,000, and then say, well, I think you're guilty of a crime and you should be fired, but I'm going to give you the money and you see how it works out. And if it works out, good, keep the money, but if not, you got to give it back. I mean, it's ridiculous. Not for $250,000 of the public money. The interest alone on that money over the year or two that it's going to go is going to add costs. It's just, um, this is just not well thought out. Could you discuss some finer points of the contract that you could clearly see as not advantageous to the public and very heavily weighted towards the police chief? Without having reviewed the entire uh, contract uh, that was his original employment contract, it's no different than the other contracts that they enter into with these high-level officials. And they're very heavily weighted to the benefit of the prospective employee. And the reason for that is because Hawaii, for whatever reason, feels that they cannot compete with the mainland. And they always want to say that they're bringing in the best talent, um, the brightest talent. And to do that, they have to pay mainland prices or they're not going to get that talent. That's the mentality that is really sinking this ship before it even sets sail. They're, they're throwing common sense to the wind. They're overpaying the people for these positions by Hawaii standards. We all know it's more expensive to live in Hawaii. We all know we don't make as much money here as we could in the mainland. But they feel that they have to pay those prices. And so in addition to those prices, there's the benefits package. And one of the benefits package to all of these high-end contracts is how does the contract end? And if it's for cause, the city works out great. But if the guy is just doing a horrible job, like the coaches have a losing season, mm -hmm. and then they want to get rid of them, they have to buy them out. Mm -hmm. Well, that should be anticipated. Poor performance should be a basis for cause in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's kind of like a marriage. They're not writing up a very good prenuptial agreement here. Mm -hmm. um, and those contracts need to be reviewed. And again and again, especially in the university system, we see this again and again. And so for the chief now to ha be in the same position is not the chief's fault. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the old don't hate the player, hate the game kind of thing. I don't fault the chief for taking advantage of his, or I shouldn't even say taking advantage. I don't fault the chief for enforcing his contract that he had with the city. Mm -hmm. He's not asking for anything more than he would be entitled to. Mm -hmm. And if they don't follow the contract, he's within his rights to threaten you know, legal action to enforce that contract. Mm -hmm. Which tells you something right there, is that if they're looking at their own contract and saying, well, we're going to have a problem, we're probably going to lose if the chief comes to sue us, that's a problem right there. It's Who's a poor, writing poorly written it? Contract, it's a poorly yeah. written contract, and who wrote it? Corporation counsel, the same people that are now trying to fire him. 
So the city really has nobody to blame but themselves in this case. And they're only making it worse at this point by allowing a third body, this police commission, to come in and make this hiring or firing decision. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very interesting to see where that money comes from because that's the dispute right now. The Honolulu City Council is saying, look, if we're not part of this, don't come ask us for money because we're not paying anything. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to do it, do it on your own and take the money out of the HPD's budget. However, when money gets taken out of the HPD budget to ultimately pay uh, the police chief, doesn't that just mean they're gonna go ahead and ask for a bigger budget that year or the next year? to compensate for the lost money? They'll try, and they'll most likely be denied because nobody was consulted in the payment of the money. For example, I just settled a lawsuit against the city and county uh, and the police department for $4.7 million. The police commission had nothing to do with that. The city council approved those funds. It came from the city's um, general fund, but this one, they've been excluded. So in this case, if the police commission is going to fire him, they're going to go out on their own and they're probably going to have to, to flip the bill. And guess what that means? Less money for police officers, mm -hmm. less money for cars, which goes back to Kealoha doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Okay? He wants to take money and put it in his pocket rather than put his rank and file officers first. So they're not getting the body cameras, they're not getting the armor, they're not getting the overtime that they need to be safe and have backup officers. Because he feels, oh, Poor me, you know, I make $180,000 a year and I'm under indictment, so feel sorry for me and give me a bunch of money. He's literally taking that money away from the rank and file officers. And I think that's a shame and it jeopardizes public safety. But mm -hmm. the Honolulu Police Commission is not looking at any of that. They're just looking at the numbers and going, well, let's try to save some money. Mm -hmm. It gets controversial when you look at things from a core values and principles standpoint and then you compare it to just the dollars and cents. The dollars and cents argument says, yeah, paying, pay him, paying him out for the $250,000 saves money in the long term. However, he's still a Hawaii resident and he's going to be here in Hawaii and he needs to be able to hold up his head up high and have some sort of uh, core values. Do you think there's ever a scenario where voluntarily to save face or to have a better uh, public face, he would ever consider just giving back the money or not accepting the money in the first place just to sort of make things pono in such a way? Well, it's interesting you say that because he has other civil lawsuits pending. He's suing the Ethics Commission for investigating and slandering him. Him and his wife have gone on uh, mainstream media and held news conferences saying that you know we're being unfairly targeted because of our race because of our position you know this is all a political attack um, they filed civil lawsuits and everything trying to clear their name but then when it comes to this now and he's being offered a check suddenly it's like oh I don't need to clear my name I don't care if it looks bad I'll just take the money and go over here mm -hmm. so it's really inconsistent for him to be screaming his innocence on one hand and at the other hand taking a payment to just keep quiet and go away and not contest the charges mm -hmm. so um, you know it all goes back to the beginning which is depends what happens if he gets indicted and convicted his reputation is ruined his career is ruined and he's gonna to go to jail okay but we don't know if that's gonna happen so that's why we're way too premature on this and I think the best way for him to keep face with the community is to maintain his innocence maintain his stance mm -hmm. um, now taking a plea deal in a criminal case is a different matter because a lot of people will say yeah I did it just to stay out of jail mm -hmm. but this has nothing to do with it this is basically him just you know, biting the hand that's fed him. You know, he went from this leader of this police organization to now screw everybody, give me my money, I hate all of you, you're treating me bad, you're treating my wife bad, and meanwhile the FBI is serving search warrants on his wife's computers. It's, it, it's ridiculous. You're either in it or you're not. And you gotta p take a stand and go with it. And he's flip-flopping back and forth. And I think that's where I think Chief Kealoha did have a lot of support and the community was willing to just wait and see what happened. 
but because he's changed his position and he's gone, I think, too much on the offensive mm -hmm. um, and pointing fingers at everybody, everybody's saying, wait a minute, this is not right, and now we got to pay him $250,000. No, we were willing to give him the benefit to see what happens, but we're not paying $250,000 and then let him sit around and wait and see what happens. You and I both work with people who are accused of crimes, they go to court, and then they end up winning their case. However, the everyday person doesn't get to threaten to sue or sue the government to be made whole after all that happens. What's the difference between Chief Kealoha and the everyday person where the everyday person can't sue or threaten to sue, yet Police Chief Kealoha has got all this leverage on the threat of suing for wrongful termination? It primarily comes down to the nature of the work. Is it public sector work or is it private sector work? The public sector in Hawaii, unlike many states, have unions, government workers here, the HGEA, Hawaii Government Employees Association. They have very strong unions that have lobbied very hard for years to have these um, ironclad employment contracts. So they get their 15 minute breaks an hour, they get their 21 days sick leave, 21 days paid vacation, all this stuff is written into their contract. So what they lack sometimes in salary, they make up for immensely in benefits that can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes as we've seen in the, in the Chief's case. So you see, for example, public school teachers will be accused of misconduct. They're put on leave. And they're put on administrative leave with pay or without pay depending on the nature of the allegation. So even at a lower level, the so-called average public worker still has the benefit of all these contracts. It's just when you get to the administrative um, levels like the chief of police, the dean of, of students at the school, um, you know, it, it, they have an independent separate contract even above the normal union contracts. In the private sector, um, you don't have those usually type of agreements unless of course it's a union. But most of your run-of-the-mill businesses, you know, you work for a restaurant or something, you don't have that union protection, but you do still have civil rights laws and equal employment opportunity laws. So you can't be fired because of your race, your gender, things like that. But those are much harder to enforce. Um, and most of those regular employees don't have the um, resources to go hire an attorney. When you belong to a union, that's why they have unions, is you go see your union rep and they have a union lawyer. That's why you pay your dues every month and they will go to bat. And at that point, the private sector, like in this case, the police commission, doesn't want to go to bat against Shopo and against private attorneys that have come to the chief's aid because he's a high level employee, he can afford a private attorney. They don't, they don't want to do that battle, which is ridiculous because the city has the Corporation Council. They mm -hmm. have an army of lawyers that mm -hmm. do nothing but defend the city against lawsuits. And, and, how, and how many yeah. times do you hear of the city going to trial? All you ever hear is settlement, 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 settlement. So at some point, where does it end? Do they ever go to trial? It's like we don't negotiate with terrorists because it's just going to set a precedent. You don't pay kidnappers because then they'll keep doing it. You have to draw the line and sometimes you have to take a hit to put this to an end. And this just sets a bad precedent um, and just leaves a sour taste in people's mouths. As the government is concerned, technically they have a bottomless pit of money because the taxpayer will always subsidize them whether they win or lose. So they could hunker down and litigate the bejesus out of just about anything, yet they choose not to. Why do you suppose certain agencies are apt to pay really big settlements when it's just the same when it comes to the money that's in reserve to just go ahead and litigate it and maybe stand up for something, stand up for a principle, stand up for a core value, instead of just taking the easy way out and paying? The answer to that is because most of the time they know that if they do litigate it, they're going to lose because mm -hmm. the city employees or the city is at fault, it is liable, mm -hmm. and therefore in those cases, the just and moral thing to do would be to settle it. Mm -hmm. 
um, and it's also the legal right thing to do. If you know you're going to lose, why go to trial? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, the city screws up all the time and the taxpayers have to pick up the tab. But then the people should pay the consequences. So if a rank and file public employee screws up, they get fired. Mm -hmm. Okay, But what we don't see happen is the high level ranking people get fired. So mm -hmm. in this case, everyone's saying the chief of police should resign, he should step back, he should do all kinds of things. But the police commission didn't do it. They're like, no, we're not going to fire him. We're not going to fire him. We're just going to let him keep going on, screwing up, and potentially costing us money. And then just at some point when it suits them, saying, well, enough is enough. Mm. Chief Kealoha has clearly played the game very well and has come up with a very big settlement, a uh, pension for all the work that he has done, which he does deserve for the 33 years of service, um, the lifetime medical. He's got a really good package of things to leave. Well, no, he does have all those things, and that's what pisses people off is, well, geez, how greedy is this guy? He's mm. got this great deal. He's probably going to get indicted, and we're going to give him $250,000 to leave? It's like, come on, chief, you know, now it's kind of on you. Step back. Enough is enough, you know? Mm. You're lucky you're not in jail, okay? Mm. Oh, with all the small battles that he's won and how he's gamed the system, do you think in the future anything will change and maybe government contracts will be um, agreed upon on more smart terms for the taxpayers as opposed to just the terms they are now where it seems like the public always loses? Senator Will Asparrow is really on top of this. He seems to be the only voice in the legislature that even cares about these issues. Um, he's very outspoken, but he's, he's right on top of things when he looks at these contracts and says, this is ridiculous. Unless we have somebody like that to really take the ball and run with it and get something done, no, it's business as usual. People just say, well, that's corporation counsel, that's the city lawyers, it's their job to write the contracts. And then, you know, most of the contracts go through without any problem. But when they don't, it's, it's clear to any first year law student that this is a ridiculous contract. Who would guarantee somebody five years employment uh, with no requirement that they do a good job or that they can be fired? See, part of the thing is, when you get to these higher level positions, like elected positions, like the prosecutor, they get extra benefits because they have to go through the hassle of being elected. They have to go through the extra hassle. I mean, they have so much responsibility. They're rewarded for it in a higher salary. Mm -hmm. So to me, it makes no sense at all why they not only have to get that higher salary, but also a guaranteed job. If they're doing a good job, they should be on a year-to-year -year contract because they have so much power and they're getting so much more money to do that job. You, five years is too long to have a bad chief of police in there, mm -hmm. and it's not long enough to have a great chief of police. Right mm -hmm. now, the city prosecutor has no term limits, mm -hmm. and we've only had two prosecutors in the last 25, 30 years because of that. The voters were given an option this year to impose term limits on the city prosecutor's office, but it didn't pass because they bunched it in um, or bundled it in with the same uh, ballot measure that said if you want to put in term limits on or extend term limits for the governor, you have to also extend term limits for the prosecutor. And there were many people that wanted to say, let's give term limits to the prosecutor, but not for the governor, and you couldn't do both. So mm -hmm. most people chose not to let the governor be governor for three terms. Mm -hmm. And so the prosecutor right now has control of his full budget. He has um, unlimited terms. And and we're stuck with that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's very simple to go through and rewrite an employment contract. But I mm -hmm. think you need to go back to the base mentality, which is, we can't compete with the mainland on everything. We have a lot of local talent here. We have a lot of bright and brilliant people who will work here. There's a lot of people that have worked in government. They've come from private practice. They spend two, three, four years you know, working for the AG's office, and they go back into 
private practice. They kind of do their public service almost. Those people don't have these golden parachute contracts and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think until that mentality changes, you're not going to see those contracts being rewritten because mm -hmm. the, the powers to be have made the decision that we need these juicy, attractive um, incentives in these contracts in order to attract the best people. And then it turns out that the people they hired end up being far from the best people and in this case maybe end up being convicted criminals. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need to change first. Writing the contract is not hard, but changing the mindset of why they're writing the contract is what needs to change. Mm -hmm. Do you think as we close in on this interview and end things, do you think we're going to have the exact same conversation in another few years because there'll be another high-ranking official who's accused of wrongdoing, who's got a sweet government sort of position where you can't get fired in a great employment contract? Do you think we're just going to have this exact same conversation within the next few years again? I think we're going to have it in a few months when Kathy K. Aloha gets indicted and she starts screaming for her benefits uh, for being a public employee at the city prosecutor's office. Um, I also think if Nick Rolovich at UH doesn't have a good season mm -hmm. in a year or two, we may be seeing him being ousted and then asking for the balance of his contract to be paid. Um, we're going to keep having this conversation again and again until they realize they're, they're writing contracts and making promises that the taxpayers can't keep.